Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you very much for the invitation to join you here today. It's a pleasure to be here at the start of uh, the new year and to share my thoughts on the prospects for the economy and the role of monetary policy going forward. But as you will hear in a minute, um, I, I'm also interested in your thoughts on the state of the economy and on your questions about Federal Reserve policy. So I look forward to also to the discussion that will take place after my talk. So my remarks today, I'll first provide some background about the Federal Reserve. I'll then describe the current stance of monetary policy. I'll discuss the macroeconomic outlook for the next couple of years that is implied by that monetary policy stance. Finally, I'll offer my assessment of the appropriateness of monetary policy in light of that outlook. But it's very important that I begin um, uh, with a disclaimer. As you will hear shortly, and as you've already heard, I'm one of the 19 people who have the privilege and honor to participate in the meetings of what's called the Federal Open Market Committee. FOMC meetings shape the course of monetary policy in the United States. But it's very important to understand that my remarks today are only my views and not necessarily those of any other FOMC participant. So as I mentioned, I'm going to begin with some basics about the Federal Reserve System. So I like to tell people that the Fed is a uniquely American institution. What do I mean when I say that? Well, when you look around the world at other central banks, relative to those other central banks, our central bank here in the United States is highly decentralized. The Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is one of 12 uh, regional reserve banks that along with the uh, Federal Reserve Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., makes up the Federal Reserve System. Our bank represents the ninth of the 12 Federal Reserve Districts. Our district includes Montana, it includes the Dakotas, Minnesota, Northwestern Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It's the second largest by area in the whole system. Eight times per year, the Federal Open Market Committee um, the FOMC meets to set the path of short-term interest rates over the next six to seven weeks. All 12 presidents of the various regional Federal Reserve Banks, including me, and the seven governors of the Federal Reserve Board contribute to these deliberations. But the committee itself consists only of the seven governors, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and a rotating group of four other presidents. So I won't be on the committee in 2013, but I will be next year. In this way, the structure of the FOMC mirrors the Federalist structure of our government because representatives from different regions of the country, the various presidents, have input into the deliberations of the FOMC. Now, I think this Federalist structure is important for a number of reasons, but one, one in particular that I want to highlight is that it fosters valuable two-way communication between Americans and their central bank. Now, of course, one direction of communication is from regional Fed presidents uh, to the residents of their districts. Like when we give speeches, as it's taking place right now, write articles for our bank publications, or present material on our websites. But the other direction matters a lot, too. The input from the presidents to the FOMC relies critically on the information that we receive about local economic performance in our districts. We obtain this information from the work of our research staffs, but we also obtain it through ongoing conversations uh, with business and community leaders. And after I'm done taking, uh, talking, uh, your questions and, and comments will be another important input into my thinking about policy. In my view, this two-way communication between the residents of Main Street and the Federal Reserve System, mediated by the presidents of the regional feds, is a critical ingredient to the system's ongoing effectiveness. Congress requires the FOMC to make monetary policy at our meetings so as to fulfill two mandates, to promote price stability and to promote maximum employment. I think it should be clear that both of these mandates 
our Main Street objectives. Promoting maximum employment means that the Fed is charged with doing what it can to ensure that Americans who want to work can do so. Promoting price stability means that the Federal Reserve is charged with keeping inflation close to a pre-specified target. Price stability ensures that when people write contracts in terms of dollars, like student loans or annuities, they can have certainty about what those dollars will be able to buy in the future. Now in describing price stability, I've made reference to a pre-specified target for inflation. I haven't said what that pre-specified inflation target is. In choosing its inflation target, the FOMC weighed the cost of overly high inflation against the need to guard against potentially destructive negative inflation, so-called deflation. And it's this assessment that has led the FOMC to choose an inflation target of 2%. Similarly, most central banks around the world have opted for a low, but still positive, inflation target. Now, the FOMC acts to achieve these goals, its two mandates, maximum employment and price stability, by influencing, influencing interest rates through the purchase and sale of financial assets. When the FOMC raises interest rates, households and firms tend to spend less and save more. This fall in spending puts downward pressure on both employment and prices. Similarly, when the FOMC lowers interest rates, households and firms tend to spend less and save less, spend more, excuse me, and save less. This puts upward pressure on employment and prices. But these pressures on employment and prices are not felt immediately, instantaneously. Instead, they unfold over time. It typically takes a year or two for the effects of monetary policy adjustment to manifest themselves in inflation and unemployment. Hence, the FOMC's decisions about appropriate monetary policy necessarily hinge on the members' forecasts of the evolution of prices and employment over the next year or two, what we typically call our medium-term outlooks for inflation and unemployment. And so I'll discuss the interaction between my outlook and appropriate policy uh, later in my remarks. So that's my, uh, the background uh, that I want to present to you, a Federal Reserve System which is decentralized, involving regional Fed presidents and deliberations over monetary policy, making monetary policy so as to achieve our two objectives set for us by Congress of promoting price stability, meaning keeping inflation close to 2%, and promoting maximum employment. Um, and we do that by um, buying and selling financial assets uh, in, in order to uh, put, put uh, upward and downward pressure on interest rates. So that's my background. Let me move on then to describe the current stance of monetary policy. The change in monetary policy over the past five years has been dramatic. If you were to go back to the end of 2007, at the end of 2007 the Federal Reserve had less than $900 billion of assets and most of that was in the form of short-term treasuries. It was targeting a Fed funds rate, the short-term interbank lending rate, of, of, above, of, of above 4%. As of the end of 2012, the Federal Reserve owns nearly $3 trillion of assets, mostly in the form of long-term government-issued or government-backed securities. The Fed is currently targeting a Fed funds rate of under one quarter of one percent. Both of these changes in the stance of policy are designed to put upward pressure on employment and prices. In particular, the near zero Fed funds rate pushes downward on the interest rate that businesses and households can earn by saving money and downward on the interest rate that they have to pay to borrow money. These low interest rates encourage households to consume today rather than saving to consume in the future. Similarly, firms are encouraged to engage in capital expenditure rather than saving. This higher demand for current consumption and investment pushes upward on both prices and employment. Similarly, 
the Fed's um, um, large holdings of long-term assets mean that the private sector as a whole is less exposed to the interest rate risk that's embedded in long-term investments. As a result, some private investors will demand a lower premium for holding other bonds that are exposed to interest rate risk, and that puts downward pressure on other long-term yields. Faced with these lower yields, households and businesses should be more willing to spend now rather than spend later. Now, I've been describing the Fed's current policy stance, its current actions. But the impact of monetary policy in the macroeconomy also depends critically on the private sector's beliefs about the Fed's future actions. Let me take an obviously hypothetical extreme. Suppose that the private sector were to believe today that the Fed would return permanently to its 2007 policy stance at its March meeting, less than two months away. Then the macroeconomic impact of the Fed's highly accommodative policy stance, which I've described, over the next two months would be negligible. Okay? If people believe that stance were to be re reversed in two months' time, then the impact would be negligible over the next two months because of their expectations of the change. For this reason, the Federal Open Market Committee has gone to great lengths to provide what's called forward guidance. And this is communication to the public about the likely future evolution of the FOMC's future, policy, uh, future uh, monetary policy decisions. For example, the committee is currently buying $85 billion of long-term assets each month. It has provided forward guidance about uh, its future plans for asset purchases by saying that it intends to continue those purchases until there is substantial improvement in the labor market outlook. The committee has provided even more precision about the likely future path of the Fed funds rate. In its December statement, the FOMC announced that it anticipated keeping the Fed funds rate at its current extraordinarily low level, um, at least until the unemployment rate fell below a threshold of 6.5%, as long as the medium-term inflation outlook remained below 2.5%, and longer-term inflation expectations remained well anchored. So the unemployment rate is currently 7.8%. And most private sector forecasters see the unemployment rate staying above 6.5% well into 2015. The FOMC communication tells the public that it should expect the Fed funds rate to stay, stay extraordinarily low over that same time frame and possibly longer. The FOMC's communications about interest rates also tells the public how the stance of monetary policy will evolve in response to changes in economic conditions. For example, if the unemployment rate were to fall more slowly than expected, the Fed funds rate will be extraordinarily low for a longer period of time. If the unemployment rate were to fall more rapidly than expected, the Fed funds rate will be extraordinarily low for a shorter period of time. In this way, the FOMC has assured the public that the stance of monetary policy will automatically adjust in appropriate fashion to the evolution of macroeconomic conditions. This automatic adjustment, I think, is an important benefit of the Fed's thresholds that I've described. Okay, so that's the stance of monetary policy. And I think uh, I've described the stance of monetary policy, but I've also described, and I think it's very important, how the Fed has communicated about how that stance will evolve in response to future economic conditions um, through its so-called forward guidance about monetary policy. It's that communication about the future evolution which is very critical for how stimulative policy is in fact today. Okay, so I, I've described, uh, um, the, uh, I've talked, uh, now I'm repeating myself, but the, I've described the Fed's current policy in some detail and have emphasized how it's more, uh, the stance is more accommodative, much more accommodative than it was five years ago. And that observation alone might suggest that the Fed's policy is too accommodative. But there have been big changes in the economy since 2007. Over the past five years, Americans have lost jobs and a great deal of wealth. Relative to 2007, people remain uncertain about future employment and income. 
Businesses also are less certain about the future demand for their goods. These changes and uncertainties make firms and households less willing to spend than they were in 2007. And so they push down on employment and prices. This means that in order to fulfill its dual mandate of promoting price stability and max employment, it is indeed appropriate for the FOMC to adopt a more accommodative monetary policy stance than they had in 2007. The right question is a more subtle one. Is the FOMC over-responding to the changes in the economy since 2007 by providing too much accommodation? So, as I noted earlier, the impact of monetary policy on the macro economy unfolds only slowly over time, over the course of, of a year or two. So that my answer to this question about whether the FOMC is providing too much accommodation really depends on my outlook for the economy over the next year or two. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn now to describing my outlook, placed in the context of the evolution of the macro economy over the past five years. So let's start by looking at the evolution of national output. As, and this is, uh, I'm measuring national output uh, by uh, gross domestic product adjusted for inflation, so-called real GDP. So the, the shaded area in these charts the, uh, that you can see from the end of 2007 to the middle of 2009, that shaded area represents the, the uh, so-called Great Recession, okay, as dated by the National Bureau of Economic Research. So as you can see in this chart, um, if you look at the beginning of that shaded area, I'll put uh, actually, you see some wiggles. It, does not, it, it doesn't really fall sharply, but it starts to fall sharply in the second half of 2008 and, and continues to fall through the middle of 2009. Since the middle of 2009, so really at the end of that shaded area, you start to see that the national economy has recovered at a moderate rate. But we have on there a line that's drawn I'm prepared to have only one thing to point at, but I can only, I, uh, but I'll, I'll try to describe it through words. So you look at the beginning of at, at 2007, the, ch the blue line is what's happening with real GDP. The red line is what would have happened to GDP had it grown according to historical averages. So if you're standing at the end of 2007 and been asked, what do you think GDP would be in, um, at the beginning of 2013, to the end of 2012, you'd be thinking, well, it should look like the end of that red line. And in fact, it looks more like the, the blue line. That gap, you know, that means that we're about 9% below where output would have grown over the uh, past five years had it had grown in line with historical averages. So this means our recovery has been sluggish. Typically in, po in, uh, in uh, uh, recession since the post-World War II, we've seen more catch up back to that historical trend line than we, we have in the, in the, in the, in the, in the earliest recovery. And it's not surprising from that that labor markets are healing very slowly. So the next chart shows the behavior of the unemployment rate over the past five years. The unemployment rate was 5% in uh, December of 2007. And it starts to rise. It actually starts to rise even before we enter the, that shaded area, even before we, we, the, the, the Great Recession begins. But in, in December of 07, it was at, uh, the, uh, the unemployment was at 5%. It shoots up to 10%, um, peaking in the, the latter half of 2009. And now we've seen certainly not a steady fall downwards, but we've been seeing a decline in the national unemployment rate. And it's uh, at 7.8% at the end of 2012. So that's what's going on, on in terms of output, in terms of what's going on with unemployment over the past five years. What's going on in terms of inflation? Inflation has been uh, highly variable, I will say, first of all. And the reason you see so much variability in this is because, uh, one main reason I'll say that you see so much variability in this measure of inflation is, this is personal consumption expenditure inflation. And it's what's so-called headline personal consumption expenditure inflation. That is, it includes all goods and services, including ones uh, like, uh, that are related to food and energy. Uh, sometimes you'll see people refer to core PC inflation. That's taking out um, um, food and energy goods. That would be much less variable. 
In particular, if you look at um, in uh, the first half of 2008, you saw PC inflation, this is year over year, so it's measuring inflation in one month relative uh, to, to 12 months earlier. You looked at the first half of 2008, we saw a huge increase in, in uh, inflation. And that's being driven by the fact that uh, oil prices got very high, and so gas prices got very high, and that, that drove what, that, that increase. Um, it's a real lesson in this chart right away that you don't want to be using the behavior of, of headline inflation to be forecasting what's going on, going to be happening uh, down the road with headline inflation. Why is that? Because suppose you're standing in July 08, you might have thought, wow, we're going to have a lot of inflation over the next uh, year or two. Well, promptly inflation collapses. Okay? It goes uh, sharply negative. Why is that? Because of the fact that oil prices collapsed in, in the second half, latter half of 2008. I think it's important, you know, when you're looking using at uh, a, a variable like uh, we do, the Fed does target, um, when we talk, say we are targeting inflation, 2% inflation, we're targeting the, the rate of increase of the prices of all goods and services, not just uh, a, a subset. But it's important to take a long enough time horizon when you're doing that because of the fluctuations that, that are coming from, from uh, gasoline prices. So uh, um, if you look at uh, the average over the past five years, the uh, PC price index has grown at an average annual rate of 1.7%, and that's marked on that chart. Right now, it's uh, the year-over-year -year PC price index has grown about at 1.4%. So if I, I think the, the latest data we have is from November of 2012 going back to November of 2011, and that's uh, growing at 1.4%. So that's a brief review of the past five years. Real output remains well below what one would expect it to be in light of historical growth patterns in the United States. Unemployment remains well above 2007 levels. And inflation has averaged over the past five years below the Fed's target. So that's the past. Let me use that now to tell you about, about my outlook for the next couple of years. And I, I, when I make an outlook, it has to be predicated on some assumptions about policy, about monetary policy in particular. And my outlook is going to be predicated on the assumption that the FOMC's monetary policy choices over the next few years will be consistent with the forward guidance about asset purchases and the Fed funds rate that I told you about earlier that the committee provided in its December FOMC statement. With that assumption about policy, my outlook for the next two years can be summarized as being an ongoing modest recovery. So I'm going to go through the same charts again, except I'm going to add uh, uh, data, <laughs> data is not the right word, forecasts for 2013 and 2014, how I expect the, the economy to be evolving. So I, I'll first say that I see output continuing to grow slowly at around 2.5% in 2013 and around 23% in 2014. So if you looked off to the right, you'll see the, the Coach Lakota numbers for 2013 and 2014. Those are my forecasts for real GDP growth. In, uh, in 2013 and 2014. Uh, this is roughly in line with long-run historical averages, but the fact that we're roughly in line with long-run historical averages means we're not going to be making up any ground on that gap relative to the long-run historical trend that I described earlier. And the only way to make up ground on that is to have growth well, well uh, materially above 2.5%, uh, and I'm not seeing that, I, I'm not forecasting that over the next, next two years. Now, consistent with that slow output growth, I, I expect unemployment to continue to fall along slowly. Uh, down to around 7.5% in late 2013 and down to around 7% in late 2014. Okay, so again, you're, you're, you'll see the red line continuing off the blue line. That represents uh, how I expect the economy to be evolving. Now, this level of unemployment this high level of unemployment um, will continue to constrain wage growth. So I expect inflation pressures to remain subdued as well. Starting, you'll see inflation start to rise. Uh, I do see inflation uh, rising backward, uh, back up to 2%, but I expect inflation to be uh, running around 1.6% in 2013 and 1.9% 1 in 2014. Okay, so that's my, that's my outlook. It's a continuation, I would say, of what we've seen in the past five years. I expect that to continue to unfold. A modest recovery, and congruent with that modest recovery, 
um, slow declines in unemployment and, um, and uh, subdued inflationary pressures. Oops, I'm not supposed to go there yet. I'm supposed to hide that. Okay. So I've described my macroeconomic outlook for 2013 and 2014. Let me turn now to how that outlook informs my judgment about monetary policy. As you will hear, my main conclusion is that my outlook implies that monetary policy is currently not accommodative enough. Recall that the FOMC has a 2% inflation target. And I do see inflation uh, eventually returning to that 2% target under the FOMC's current forward guidance. But I, I, as I depicted, and in fact you see it on this chart, I expect a slow rate of progress back to 2%. As I've said, you know, as you see here, I, expect, uh, I anticipate the inflation rate to be 1.6% in 2013 and 1.9% in 2014. The FOMC could facilitate a faster return of the PC inflation rate to the 2% target that is better promote price stability as has been mandated by Congress by adopting a more accommodated monetary policy that puts more upward pressure on prices. Now, I've reached this conclusion that monetary policy should be more accommodative by making reference only to the price stability mandate. As I described earlier, the FOMC ha indeed has a second mandate to promote maximum employment. In December, most of the 19 FOMC participants, 13 of them at, uh, uh, at least, believe that the unemployment rate will converge to a level between 5.2% and 6% over, uh, within five to six years. But under the current formulation of monetary policy, I see the rate of convergence to this long run rate is likely to be slow. In particular, I expect, as I described to you, and you can see it here, I expect the unemployment rate will still be close to 7% by the end of 2014. So I said that uh, FOMC participants expect that within five to six years, we'll get back down to unemployment between 5.2 and 6%. That will be consistent with 2% inflation. But, um, but I see unemployment is still being at uh, 7% at the end of 2014. The FOMC could facilitate a faster return of the unemployment rate to its lower long run level by adopting a more accommodative monetary policy that puts more upward pressure on employment. So I'd say that my outlook both for unemployment, as you see here, and for inflation, as you see here, point in the same direction. They both point to a need for more accommodation on the part of the FOMC than is currently being provided by the FOMC. So what to do? Based on my outlook for the next two years, I've concluded that the FOMC would, be better, would better fulfill both of its congressional mandates by adding more monetary policy accommodation. How, how can we best do so? So it's in, in its current forward guidance, as I mentioned uh, 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 some time ago now, the FOMC has stated that it expects the Fed funds rate to remain extraordinarily low at least until the unemployment rate falls below 6.5%. In my view, it would be appropriate for the FOMC to provide more needed stimulus by lowering that threshold unemployment rate from 6.5% to 5.5%. Now, why do I say that? Consider two possible scenarios. In the first, the public believes that the, Fed, the FOMC will begin raising the Fed funds rate once the unemployment rate hits 6.5%. Now, I want to be clear, this belief on the part of the public is consistent with, but not necessarily implied by the FOMC's current foreign guidance, which only, it says th that it will keep the Fed funds rate extraordinarily low at least until the uh, unemployment rate falls below 6.5%. It does not say it will immediately begin to raise rates at that point. That's why we use, refer to that as a threshold, not a trigger. But suppose the public were to believe that. The unemployment rate hits 6.5%. Uh, the FOMC will begin to raise rates. In the second scenario, the public believes that the FOMC will defer the initial increase in the Fed funds rate until the unemployment rate hits 5.5%. Higher unemployment rate in the first scenario means that monetary policy will be tightened sooner, which in turn will lead to the unemployment rate being higher for longer. Foreseeing that, 
people will save more in the first scenario than in the second to protect themselves against these higher unemployment risks. Because they are saving more, they're spending less, and so there's less econ economic activity. Thus, lowering the unemployment uh, rate threshold to 5.5% would increase the demand for goods and thereby push upward on both employment and prices. W I think a key question is, would this extra monetary stimulus result in an undue amount of inflation at some point in the future? And here I find the recent historical evidence to be, to be comforting. So I, this is the secret chart that I was going to hiding from you that this chart documents that the medium term inflation outlook has not risen above two and a quarter percent in the past 15 years, even the unemployment rate was at times below five percent. So what this is, this, the first, uh, the green area, let me talk, talk about what's in white first. So this is uh, 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 the, the uh, Federal Open Market Committee participants um, forecast for inflation, their outlook for inflation one to two years out based on what's called the Summary of Economic Projections. This is uh, uh, released every quarter by the FOMC. What, they, what the participants foresee is going to be happening to inflation over the next year or two and actually further out, but we picked out the, the uh, one to two year ahead forecasts. They began doing that in, in uh, 2007. And so the area in green is coming from what, uh, what used to be called the Green Book, now it's called the Teal Book. Anyways, the Fed is <laughs> likes their colors. Um, but, but this is coming from internal staff forecasts of what's happening to inflation. And uh, um, uh, so this is, you know, you can, can read all that if you want to. It's available on our website um, from, uh, from 2006 back. Okay? And that, so you'll see, see that's, what that's what's in that chart. And um, if you look at these outlooks, the medium term inflation outlook has not risen above two and a quarter percent in the past 15 years. Even though uh, if you look back to our, um, unemployment chart, it was actually below 5% in, uh, in, in, uh, in 2007. So this historical evidence suggests to me that as long as the unemployment rate remains above 5.5%, the medium term inflation outlook will stay close to 2%. Now, using the past, you know, I don't need to tell you this, the past is never a perfect guide to the future. But I see the committee's estimates of future long-run unemployment as also being consistent with this historical evidence. As I mentioned to you earlier, most of FMC participants expect that over the long run, within the next five to six years, uh, an unemployment rate of between 5.2 and 6% is consistent with an inflation rate of 2%. These estimates also suggest that as long as the unemployment rate remains above 5.5%, wage pressures will not be sufficiently strong in the economy to uh, generate a medium-term inflation outlook much in excess of 2%. But all this is estimates. These are all estimates based on what we know now about labor market conditions. New information and new analysis could lead the FOMC's estimates of the long-run unemployment rate to evolve over time. And that's why the FOMC's current forward guidance contains what I see is strong protection against undue inflation. As I described earlier, that guidance clearly states that the committee's commitment to a low Fed funds rate is off the table if the medium term inflation outlook ever rises above 2.5%. Now, as I've described to you, and I'll repeat that, I see it as unlikely that this threshold would ever be breached, even if the committee were to lower the unemployment threshold to 5.5%. So to sum up, my outlook for both inflation and unemployment means that the FOMC should provide more monetary accommodation. In December, the FOMC said that it anticipates keeping the Fed funds rate extraordinarily low, at least until the unemployment rate falls below 6.5%. In my view, it would be appropriate for the committee to increase the level of monetary accommodation by lowering the unemployment rate threshold to 5.5%. Some might be concerned that this move would give rise to undue inflationary pressures. I see that possibility as unlikely. And even if I'm wrong in my assessment, the committee's forward guidance provides tight inflation safeguards. So I'll conclude.
Monetary policy affects the economy with a lag of one or two years. And hence, a policymaker's views about the appropriate level of monetary policy accommodation depend on his or her forecast for how the economy will evolve over the next year or two. My own outlook is that growth will remain moderate over the next two years. As a result, under current policy, my outlook for inflation is that it will run below the Fed's target of 2% over the next two years, and that the unemployment rate will be above 7% over that same time frame. Hence, the FOMC can better promote price stability, better promote maximum employment, as mandated by Congress, by adopting a more accommodative policy stance. It can provide that extra accommodation by lowering the unemployment rate threshold in its forward guidance to 5.5% from the current setting of 6.5%. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you.